Wouldn't it be weird to find out that the secret of life can be found on sayings on coffee mugs? <laughs> yeah, that would be weird. Oh wow, there's a good book. The Art of Worldly Wisdom. <laughs> Why is it wherever I go there's books on wisdom? Don't answer that. I hope there's not a letter in this one. days where you can't understand anything, let alone coffee cups. Does this ring make me look engaged? Why is that funny? Is that funny? I don't know. I gotta be honest, that is the creepiest figurine I have ever seen. typical uh, whiskey flask. You can fill it with your favorite whiskey, scotch, mm -hmm. bourbon, American whiskey, Canadian whiskey, uh, gin. Uh-huh. So people would put like milk or Kool-Aid in there while they're playing golf? Negatory. No. They put whiskey. Are you sure? Positive. We put stuff in through these holes mm -hmm. and you could make like frozen Kool-Aid or something like that, or mm -hmm. frozen juice. Frozen whiskey? <laughs> I'm not as thin as I thought oh, I was. Just a tile that's in a like a frame tile or something. Why would somebody have that in their house? Stupidity. Everybody, thank you so much for coming back and seeing me and Desi today. I hope you had a good, safe, happy week. And well, I had a really kind of fun thrift video for you today, and and maybe I still do. But a few days ago, a very important person in my life passed away, and I need to talk to you about that. When when we get older, we lose so many people, don't we? When we get in our late 60s and 70s and 80s, it seems like we lose people every single year. And I want to talk about how that makes me feel, how it might make you feel, and some of the coping skills that I have used to get me through. I want to, I want to bring you back to when I was in my 20s and I married one of the most popular disc jockeys in town on the number one station, LAB. What I learned is as a disc jockey's wife, you are required to go to certain parties, station parties, consultant parties, you name it. So they're horrible things and they're always boring. But I would go and I would dress all up and sit there and 
you know, eat the bad food and have to, you know, say my hellos. But every single party that I was forced to go to, there was another popular disc jockey named Eris. And he and I would always find each other and we would sit right across from each other and we would talk for three straight hours, just he and I. The whole world would fall away. I would sit there at 24 years old and I would feel so insecure, but he would pump me up. He would make me feel like I was something so beautiful and special and talented. There was no flirtation. There was no that feeling of falling in love. It was this magical feeling of here is like my soulmate, someone who sees me, and I saw him. When I was 10 years old, I won tickets to a place called The Place. <laughs> and his band was the biggest band in town, and it was called The Soul Benders. And I won tickets to go see him play. Well, I was only 10 years old, but he loved that story that a 10 year old was gonna crash his gig. <laughs> he knew that I grew up admiring him and I saw his talent. I heard his talent. I knew how special he was. When Bruce Hornsby came to town, he called Eris. Eris helped him play background pianos for for the stage concert. There's a thousand stories like that. Eris was so talented as a songwriter, as a keyboard player, as a singer. And Eris knew, I knew that. He wasn't just the disc jockey on LAV. He was bigger than life. And I let him know that. And he saw me too, he loved my music. We were both keyboard players. We both <laughs> maybe were a little bit tortured souls, but there was a, a tremendous communication there and love there. And it's one that I have never duplicated. When I was a kid, I found a record that my mother made and the song was Dancing with Tears in Your Eyes. And I played that record over and over again. I was so proud of my mama. She was a singer and she had a record. In my 30s, I had an opportunity to work in the studio with a great producer, some fabulous musicians, and it was such a wonderful project. Later that year, though, I got very sick and I ended up in the hospital for a few weeks. When I got out of the hospital, I was pretty, well, I felt pretty defeated. And my husband at the time looked at me and he said, you know, maybe it's time you got a real job, honey, something that would bring in some money. And that was fair. You know, we were raising our son and we needed money and so it was a fair statement it was just maybe uttered at the wrong time so there I am out of the hospital sitting in my living room feeling like a complete loser and my friend calls and he says you've got to turn on LAV Eris just announced he's doing a whole show on you and your songs your lyrics your chords I said you must be dreaming. Eris wouldn't do that. That's the number one station. He's the number one disc jockey. He couldn't do that. And he did. He did a whole hour on my music. Can you imagine how I, how I felt? How anybody would feel, not just me. But when you're at the very lowest point, and you turn on the radio and somebody's saying, this girl is gonna make it. And I did make it, just not, just not in the way that the heiress thought. And I think he knew that. So a couple years later, I won a radio contest 
and there were five bands and they were playing our songs and the top five songwriters would get to play the showcase and I was one of the one of the ones that won actually I think I was number one and Eris produced the show and it would be the very first time I would play a completely professional stage venue with over a thousand people. It was one of the most amazing nights of my life. I've talked about it here many times. When my ex-husband Eddie died, they were cleaning out his house and they, they had gotten a great big dumpster, you know, and in the sorrow and the panic, they were just, you know, throwing so many of Ed's treasures in the dumpster. I had asked, you know, could I please have the photographs, the slides, the wedding pictures? Could I please have these things? And I turned to Eris, could he help me? And he went over there and he was arranging all of Ed's belongings. And you know who else was there helping him? Hal. There was a request, there was dumpster diving, there was amazing heroism. And I think Ed would have loved it. I have my wedding pictures. I have slides of growing up with Ed and my little boy. And I have Eris to thank for that. And it's so ironic that last week I showed you this picture that Hal dug out and got for me that I thought was lost forever. I was told Ed burned all the pictures of me. <laughs> well, he didn't. And then Eris died. I had a hot dog on Saturday with extra mustard. I bought a fancy new broom that does about everything. And I said goodbye to my dear friend Eris. So maybe if the real meaning of life can be found on a coffee cup mug, mine would simply say, Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown. Maybe for Eris, empty, windfall. So many of you were worried that maybe with me moving an hour away this summer, the there wouldn't be any more Hal, but I want to assure you, Hal is part of my life. He's part of my son's life. Hal has been in my son's life since my son was four years old, so he's, he's family to us. So I promise I'll never take Hal away. What is it? Well, I was going to ask if you could pick up my dry cleaning tomorrow. Your dry cleaning? That's your special question? Yeah. Isn't that enough? I mean... All right. How many questions are there in the world? Well, I just thought maybe you had something else you were going to ask me. When nothing goes right, go left. What does that mean? We all have had a whole lifetime of dealing with grief. We know what it feels like and we have a certain set of tools that helps us cope and go on. But it's different. It's different when you get in your late 60s and beyond because you're losing people every single year. People that were a witness to your life. It's different. It's a different kind of grief. You know, I journal a lot. So when I say I write something down, I write it down. So when I lose someone that I truly love, I make sure that I start out seeing them, not when they were ill or not in the last few years of their life, but I want to see them and remember them and carry them within me as I remember them in their heyday. And the pictures that I have around of them, I want to make sure it is when they were so full of life and so happy. The number one thing I write down about that person that I just lost is how much I love them, why I love them, and what did they teach me? 
That is the most important thing. What did that person teach me? In particular, with my friend Eris, the number one thing that Eris taught me was to give. He made sure that he gave to every struggling musician a chance, a voice. If our, our good friends were, were down in the hospital, he would be the one showing up, visiting, holding a hand. He gave and he gave of himself and asked nothing in return. I wish I could say, yeah, boy, that's me. It's not. I wish it were. But that was Eris. And that's what he taught me, to strive for that. Because every time he gave of himself, it, it seems like it made him stronger. He was invincible until the very end. When we lose someone, it, we're not losing them. We're not losing ourselves in them. We're carrying them forward. When we lose a loved one, we, we just can't keep thrashing around for years and crying and, and making a mess of things, can we? That's not showing them respect. Showing them respect is sharing what their life was all about, sharing what they taught us, and making them proud. Every person that I have loved, I, I kind of hope they're looking down from heaven once in a while, and I hope they're proud in me being broken. And it's so easy to be broken. That's not gonna make them proud. I carry that with me and it helps me. But I gotta say, there's no one way to grieve. This is, this is my way and I'm sharing it with you today, but there's, there's no one way to love. There's no one way to follow our dreams and be happy. But there is only one way to live. And that is to travel light. You know, that backpack we have on our back, you know, full of fear and anger and shame and guilt and all the baggage that we can acquire as we age. We don't need that backpack. We need to travel light. That is the only way to live. We cherish our memories, but we have to make sure that it's the good that we will remember, the good that will rise the top, the good that we can share. We need to travel light as we age. In Arataki, China, I had two sets of these when I was married. I needed three. I was married three times. <laughs> hey everybody, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I loved every second of it. It means so much to me that I get to be here every week and uh, we get to talk and I get to read your comments. If you get a chance down below, could you tell me how you're handling losing so many people in the last few years of your life? Because I know so many of you have. Please have yourself a happy, safe, brand new week. And when you're done with your week, you come back and see me and Desi, okay? All right, it's a deal. We'll be here. Maybe I really have been taking this whole searching for the meaning of life thing way too seriously. Maybe the meaning of life is so simple and I've just missed it. We pack up the good and we leave the rest. Maybe it really is that simple.